Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. I was going through my YouTube dashboard the other day and I saw that my PragerU response video was my most watched video. So I figure if that's what the people want, let's give them more of it. Um, so let's let's jump in, do, do another PragerU socialism video. This one is titled Socialism Makes People Selfish. Um, it was like 3 million views, was put out a few years ago. Um, let's jump in and see what it's all about. In the contemporary world, it's taken as a given that capitalism, with its free market and profit motive, is based on selfishness and produces selfishness, while socialism is based on selflessness and produces selflessness. Let's stop there. You know, I mean, the classical case for socialism is, in a sense, a selfish case, or at least a self-interested case. Uh, in which we, we say that the workers have a self-interest in creating a socialist society because uh, then they would own and control the capital and would receive all the income and benefit from it. So it's, it's very much pitched as being in their self-interest, not as being a, a selfless thing. Uh, far from it, in fact. But, you know, that's, if he wants to go this way, we'll, we'll ride with it, see where he goes with it. Well, the opposite is true. Whatever its intentions, socialism produces far more selfish individuals and a far more selfish society than a free market economy does. Okay. And once this widespread selfishness catches on, it is almost impossible to undo it. Mm. Here's an illustration. In 2010, the United States President, Barack Obama, addressed a large audience of college students. Okay. At one point in his speech, he announced that young people will now be able to remain on their parents' health insurance plan until age 26. I don't ever recall hearing a louder, more thunderous, or more sustained applause than I did then. Had the president announced that a cure for cancer had been discovered, it is highly doubtful that the applause would have been as loud or as long. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sorry, but is this socialism? <laughs> you know, I'm even willing to tolerate, you know, this stretching of the word socialism to refer to welfare benefits and stuff, you know, just because I know people do that and I don't want to spend every video uh, like harping on that. But we're talking about a, a, a rule, a new rule in Obamacare that said that, you know, under the old rules, uh, private health insurers, when you were insuring someone, you had to uh, give people the option to also include their kids from age zero to 18. You know, you have to pay more for that. It's not free to have your kid on your health insurance. Uh, and now the, the rule changed and you have to uh, provide it up to age 26. But we're talking about private health insurance and people do have to pay for it. Where, where is the socialism? Where is even the welfare state in this? It's, it's <laughs> baffling. Okay. But what were they so happy about? To be told that you can now remain dependent on your parents until age 26 should strike a young person as demeaning, not liberating, throughout American... Uh, you know, I actually agree with that point. <laughs> You know, I you know I don't want to get I don't want to you know stunt on people who are happy about little things like that, but it's kind of goofy to say you know in our society we had a problem at the time we still do have a problem at the time that young adults have very high rates of uninsurance for all sorts of reasons, including that they're in college, so paying for insurance is kind of uh, you know not in the cards, or they might be in an entry level job where insurance just also is not in the cards. Um, especially if it's low paying, as most entry level jobs are. So we have this problem where people, essentially a market failure, I, I, I don't like that word usually, but we have essentially a, a hole in the market where it's not really plausible for young adults, a lot of young adults to like just go out into the health insurance and purchase uh, health insurance. And so the solution to that was, well, we'll let them stay on their, their parents' plan if their parent wants them on their plan, right? If the parent doesn't want you on your plan, it's not like you have a separate right to say you must include me. So, you, so the parent gets to decide whether you're on your plan. They still have to pay for it. 
Uh, and, and now you're kind of being jacked around at the whims of whatever happens to your parent. Even if your, your parent is nice and wants you on their plan and is willing to pay for it, if they lose your, their job, you lose your insurance. What kind of solution is that? That's not a solution at all. That's, that's, that's awful. Um, so, but I, I assume he's going to go somewhere else with it, so let's see. History, and for that matter, all of Western history, the great goal of young people was to become a mature adult. <laughs> beginning with being independent of mom and dad. Okay. Socialism and the welfare state destroy this aspiration. In various European countries, and now increasingly in the U.S., it is becoming common for young people to live with their parents well into their 30s and not infrequently beyond. And why not? In the welfare state, taking care of yourself is no longer a virtue. Okay, now this is interesting because he's, he's got this exactly backwards. And usually you don't see this. Usually, you know, people are shading in the wrong direction or a little bit confused. But he, in this case, he's got it exactly backwards, right? Because what's the claim here? The claim here is that when you have a generous welfare state, the, the end result of that through the destruction of the virtue of independence is that uh, people, young adults in, in particular, are more likely to live with their parents, and um, the, the data just does not back this up. So let's start with um, the U.S. here. Uh, this is from the Pew Research Center. It's from 2016. The, you know, that's a little bit a few years ago, but it's not like these numbers change a lot year to year. Um, anyways, we see here, for the first time in the modern era, living with parents edges out other living arrangements for 18 to 34-year-olds, specifically um, 32.1 percent of people between the ages of 18 and 34 are living with their parents. So about a third of, peop of young adults between the ages of 18 and 34 are living with their parents. Okay, that's that's in the U.S. And then we've got the same thing here. This is just a slightly better graph, as you see at the end in 2014. 32.1 percent of children between the not children, young adults between the ages of 18 and 34 are living with their parents. Okay, that's the U.S. Um, but there are other countries in the world, and the other countries allow us to kind of test the question uh, of how much, what, what is the welfare state doing to the independence of young adults, right? Because some countries have very generous welfare states, especially for young adults in the form of free college. Some people even get living stipends to live in college, national health insurance and for young kids, you know. And then other places have very stingy welfare states. The U.S. Is, is very well known for having a very stingy welfare state. In fact, if you look at my other PragerU video, they make a big deal of the fact that the, the, the big difference between the U.S. and, say, the Nordic uh, countries is that they have much bigger welfare states. So let's see what those much bigger welfare states do for their young adults. Right? If Mr. Prager is right, they're going to have all their young adults are just going to be living with their parents because the welfare state will have destroyed their virtue of independence and, 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 and so they'll just mooch off their parents. Um, so to look at this, uh, let's go into this Eurostat uh, database. I hate Eurostat. It's such an awful website, but this is where you get data on the EU, the official repository of EU data. Um, and we have the same statistic share of young adults aged 18 to 34 living with their parents by age and sex. Uh, we're not doing age and sex here, but anyways, here's 2014, so same year, um, and we can go through the countries. Now, you see where my mouse is moving on the bottom here. This is where the percentage is going to show up when I hover over each country. That's you know, hideous design, but like I said, that's the website we're dealing with. So let's go through the Nordic nations here, starting with Finland. Finland, 20.4% of kids, of young adults between the ages of 18 and 34 are living with their parents. Recall, in the U.S., it's 32%. So they're 12 points lower. Sweden is 24%, so that's 8 points lower. Norway is 22%, so that's 10 points lower. And then Denmark is 18%, that's 14 points lower. That's almost half. So what we're seeing, in fact, in the biggest, most generous social democratic welfare states, the young adults are much more likely to be out of the house than they are in the U.S., and we can see this here with the OECD data as well. This uses slightly different numbers. 
um, slightly different methods. You know, it's, it's useful to double check these things. So this is the living arrangements of 20 somethings. So they just look at people between the ages of 20 and 29 and they say, where are these kids? I keep saying kids. I mean, young adults. I'm not much older than this myself. So I have no right to call these people kids. Um, but where are these 20 somethings living? And the dark purple here on the bottom is living with parents. So let's look at the US here. In the US, the dark purple is right at 50%. So 50% of 20 somethings in the US are living with their parents. Now let's see where the Nordic nations are. Do, 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 do. Oh, they are the top four nations. <laughs> They have the lowest rate of 20-somethings living with their parents on this particular measure. In Sweden, only 20% of 20-somethings live with their parents. So that's less than half the, the number in the U.S. In Denmark, which is in this statistic, just like the Eurostat statistic, the sort of the best, um, only 10% of 20-somethings are living at home with their parents. So that's less than a fifth Less than a fit, I mean, a dramatic 40 percentage point difference <laughs> between Denmark and the U.S., despite the fact that these countries have much more generous welfare states. And I want to say, actually, it's not despite the fact, like I said uh, earlier, he's got this exactly backwards. What the welfare state allows people to do, and this has been extensively written about, and usually conservatives actually, this is one of the critiques conservatives will actually make about the welfare state, is that it gives people independence from family, right? At least financial independence from family. People form families for reasons that aren't just that they are financially, you know, required to do so in order to survive and stuff. People form families out of love and, and kindness and kinship and all that, all that good stuff. Um, but, you know, what the welfare state does, especially these big ind individualized social democratic welfare states, is it makes it so that you're not financially dependent on people in your family. And so that can actually enable you to move out, right? Um, and, and like I said, this has been written about a lot. Um, here's just one I saw from this year. I Like I said, there's books and books and books, hundreds of articles about this. Um, but we have this piece in The Atlantic from Stephanie Murray, The Myth of Independent American Families. In Nordic countries, people rely on the state. In the U.S., they rely on their communities. And it's funny, that gloss would often be a, a gloss that conservatives like because it seems like a critique of the welfare state. Now, Stephanie does not ultimately uh, reach that conclusion herself, but this you could see how conservatives could also look at this and be like, oh, this is ghastly. The welfare state is destroying civil society and the communitarian ethos and family connectedness and whatever. Um, but in, in Mr. Prager's uh, account, he wants those things destroyed because he, he's, a, he's a rugged individualist guy. Well, if you want those things destroyed, well, I've got a, a little tip and trick for you. It's called the welfare state because if everyone's being taken care of individually and, and their needs are being met through the welfare state, then they don't need to depend on mom and dad nor depend on necessarily on spouse or friend or anything. Right, like I said before, people still, of course, form those networks, but they, the financial uh, ties are are not are not there. Um, and you know, you can read the whole piece if you like, but I mean, here's the basic gist here, right? The f the familial dependencies woven through American life are notable to Scandinavians like Tragard and Partnin because the Nordic welfare state, especially in Sweden, is designed to eliminate precisely those dependencies. So early in the article, she talks about all these examples of people in the U.S. who just to get by and cover certain you know pitfalls of life, they're super dependent on just their relations and who they happen to know, right? So here we have, you know, someone is battling cancer and they couldn't leave a bad relationship because they didn't want to lose their uh, partner's health insurance. We have moms, of course, who can't afford childcare. They have to leave their job and now they're dependent on their husband as their sole income. Um, of course, people also depend on uh, their parents' for child care as well that's one of the main one of the big reasons why people will often live with their parents when they're young adults is because they have kids and their parents you know they they, they need the child care i'm not even saying that's necessarily a bad thing he's the one that says it's a bad thing i, I don't mind people living in inner family you know intergenerational households if they like to do that that's that seems lovely you know if, if you like doing it 
Um, the other example here, which is mentioned in the piece, that would directly relate to the age group and the dependency that uh, Dennis Prager is talking about is, of course, college benefits, right? If you have free college, and then in some of these countries, Denmark, I think, is, is most notable in this regard. It's not only free college. You also, they also give you money, you know, like a living stipend. Now, people also have to take out loans in these countries, like some smaller loans uh, sometimes to study. But um, if you got free college and you're giving people a living stipend, then it's easier for them to move out, right, if they're in college. And also they're getting free health care. Everyone's getting free health care, national health insurance. So if, if the college students are getting national health insurance, get the free college, and they get a living stipend, if you want to get them out of mom's basement, there, there you go. That'll do it. That's what we see in those countries. Now, I don't want to I don't want to go too far with this. It's not like, well, build up the welfare state and then you're for sure going to get this outcome, because obviously there are lots of factors that go into um, decisions people make about when to move out and when not to move out. These are these are cultural things. You know, some cultures like intergenerational living and really emphasize it for other cultures that's seen as a very bad thing and or at least a very non-ideal thing and 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 so they don't so that that has a that plays a big role as well but if you want to talk about the welfare state's role in particular the welfare state role is going to give people more independence from their family ties it's not going to cause them to become more dependent upon them right so he's 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 got that backwards <laughs> All right. Why? Because the government will take care of you. Therefore, socialism enables, and as a result produces, people whose preoccupations become more and more self-centered. How many benefits will I receive from the government? Will the government pay for my education? Will the government pay for my health care? What is the youngest age at which I can retire? How much paid vacation time can I get? How many days can I call in sick and still get paid? How many weeks of paid paternity or maternity leave am I entitled to? The list gets longer with every election of a liberal or progressive or left-wing party. Now, I mean, this just seems, uh, it seems half-baked, right? So if worrying about and concerning yourself with the benefits that you receive or can receive, if that makes you self-centered, then, then, then everyone is self-centered in either system, right? Because the difference we're talking about here is not whether these benefits exist, it's how these benefits are administered, how they're set up, who runs them, and who makes decisions about what kinds of benefits will be available to people, right? So in a kind of social democratic welfare state style, um, the, the benefits are public. And so, you know, they come from the government and we all kind of deliberate and we vote and, we, and, and, and through that kind of democratic process, we're deciding what the benefit package for the whole society is going to look like, whether you're going to get health care, what your co-pays are going to be, right? It's, it's done at the governmental level. And, and the alternative approach uh, of Prager, I mean, he doesn't lay this out, but in, in practice, the alternative approach is not that those benefits don't exist at all, it's that they're being administered and run by employers. And I should say, in the alternative system, in fact, those benefits do not exist for large swaths of the population because they, you know, they they don't make high enough wages or whatever, right? But but for for people who aren't in that situation, these benefits still exist, right? Like you still get retirement benefits and pension benefits; they're just administered through the employer. Healthcare, famously in the U.S., administered through the employer. Paid leave. If it's available to you at all, administered through the employer. Sick leave, again, if you available at all, it's administered through the employer. So it's not that these benefits don't exist. They're just, it's different. They're just differently administered. And so the way that you engage with them and, and focus on getting them is a little bit different, right? Because if they're public benefits, then we deliberate out in the public and it's a very kind of transparent thing and everyone's talking about what kind of benefits should or shouldn't exist. If it's an employer benefit, then, you know, you, you ask your employer, can I get more? Does that make you self-centered? I mean, it would seem like under Prager's logic, it does. Or you might even quit your job to go to a different job because that job has better health benefits or uh, has a better 401k match or something like that. Does that make you self-centered? It seems like if you're fixated on benefits, then it does. 
that's ridiculous, right? People being fix people focusing on their overall compensation package, whether that comes through social benefits or employer benefits, it's it's all the same thing. One is not more self centered than the other. Um, so. And then each entitlement becomes a right. But we're not done. Rhetoric. There are even more destructive effects of socialism. Entitlements create citizens who lack a character trait that every human should have. Gratitude. You cannot be happy if you are not grateful, and you cannot be a good person if you're not grateful. That's why we constantly tell our children, say thank you. But socialism undoes that. After all, why would a person be grateful for receiving an entitlement? Uh, you know, I don't want to get into a semantical debate here, but if you ever talk to people from social democratic countries, I happen to, uh, because of what I do, interact with a lot of them, uh, including many of them who have been to the U.S. Um, uh, there are books written by people who... Uh, you know, grew up in, say, Sweden and then moved to the U.S. Uh, and, and in those books, I will say they, they, are very, they seem to be very grateful, in fact, for their systems, right? Because you can be grateful to have a good social democratic system. And many people are grateful to have a good social democratic system, right? That system then creates a set of entitlements in the sense that you have a legal right to something. But you can still be grateful for the system, and many people are grateful for the system. So, uh, you know, it's I, th he's, I think he's trying to make a kind of um, like definitional argument here in which he says, well, if something is yours by right, if something is yours that, you, that you're entitled to, as opposed to something, I guess, that's being given to you, that's uh, sort of uh, voluntary, I wouldn't even say voluntary, that's... Uh, uh, you know, above and beyond what, what's owed to you, <laughs> then, then by definition, you can't be grateful for it. But, but plenty of people are grateful to live in good systems. Plenty of people are grateful to get parental leave. I mean, you, you see it all the time. So, um, you know, that, I, I feel like he's a little off the mark here. Who's going to be grateful for getting what they're entitled to? Oh, we just said that. So instead of thank you, the citizen of the welfare state is taught to say, what more am I entitled to? Yet the left insists that it's capitalism and the free market, not socialism, that produces selfish people. But the truth is that capitalism and the free market produce much less selfish people. Teaching people to work hard and take care of themselves and others, and that they should earn what they receive. Okay, I thought he was going. I thought he was going to go a certain way with this. That can, that can. It's the same with the welfare state thing, where you're like Prager. He doesn't even know what the smart conservative arguments are. Like the smart conservative argument against the welfare state, aside from oh, I don't like taxes and it's theft and all that garbage. But like the smart, sophisticated one that deals with things like virtue and, and the family and whatever, is that the welfare state makes you independent from your family. And that's, that's supposed to be a bad thing, you know, in certain conservative circles. And he somehow makes the opposite argument. And then in this case, it's the same situation here, right? So where I thought he was going to go with this was that you know, when you have the welfare state and, you know, the, and it just kind of wipes out poverty and inequality and it wipes out, you know, all these desperate situations, uh, there's this argument that says that it, it essentially supplants charity, right? That, that when you have this kind of system in place, there's no reason really for there to be charity and, and that kind of thing, or at least I, I think that's wrong as well. Um, it's just that charity would take on different forms, but we'll put that aside, right? There's this argument that it, that basically says that, you know, as people start just receiving these things from the state, then they no longer, we no longer have the system where people are going to organize to help people who are poor or help people who don't have health insurance. And like that, it's a great practice of civil society, basically, to make some people really destitute. 
so that other people have reason to come together and organize resources uh, to charitably make them not destitute. And then what's also nice about that is on the flip side, the person who is helped by charity gets to feel a sense of gratitude, gets to feel a sense of love from the community. And that the welfare state, yeah, it stamps out. It, it just kind of solves this problem, but it solves this problem by getting rid of all that lovely, gooey stuff where people get to be charitable and other people get to be grateful and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so in that case, the problem with the welfare state is that it supplants charity. Um, here, the route he goes is he says, well, the problem with the welfare state is it makes people feel entitled, and so they're not grateful for what they get. And then you go, okay, so what's the alternative? And the alternative is, well, in the alternative, people will work and they'll earn what they get. Okay, but do you feel grateful for what you get if you earn it? Right? Like, earning also is a, is a form of entitlement, right? You say, I am entitled to this wage because I earned it. I am entitled to this benefit because I earned it, right? You're not grateful. You're not like, oh, thank you, dear sir, for paying me my $10 an hour. You go, well, no, this was a transaction. I worked. You gave me $10 an hour. There's no gratitude. It was a, it was a transaction, right? It's like earning also negates the gratitude there's no why would you be grateful for something you earned you earned it it's yours right it's this it's the same mechanism that would destroy the gratitude right because gratitude is the way he tells it at least the way he wants to gesture it is supposed to follow from you getting something that you're not necessarily owed just because someone was being nice to you you know the community was being nice to you and they wanted to help you and you got something that you weren't necessarily owed that that's the source of gratitude but Getting a paycheck is getting what you are owed. So you wouldn't be grateful for it, right? I mean, am I missing something here? I mean, I get, he just like, he can't hold a logical thought together. Like he just is kind of sl slipping and sliding between different points, right? You can either make the point that welfare destroys uh, people's desire to earn money and say that's bad, you know, because it makes them lazy and makes them not want to work and whatever. I don't think that's true, but you could make that move. Or you could say that the welfare state supplants charity, and by supplanting charity, it takes away all this virtuous activity that's really important for civil society. You could go that route as well. Instead, he says, welfare state destroys gratitude because it means that you don't earn. But when you earn something, you're also not grateful for it because you earned it, right? Or if you could be grateful for something you earned, why couldn't you also be grateful for something that you're entitled to through the welfare state? It, I can't follow it. Produces less selfish, not more selfish people. Capitalism teaches people to work more. Socialism teaches people to demand more. Which attitude do you think will make a better society? I'm Dennis Prager. Well, certainly not working more. I've had enough of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, another just, it's just garbage. Like, this stuff is just garbage. It's not even garbage in the sense that the numbers are off. Because they are. I showed you. Like, okay, yeah, you made a claim that's just empirically false. You could just watch the video, have no other external information, and the video doesn't hang together. It doesn't make any sense. It's self-contradictory. And yet, you know, it's apparently, apparently the kids, I don't know. I don't know who watches this stuff, but obviously this stuff is very popular and, and there's a reason why people like the responses, but it's, it's shocking to me that, that anyone like consumes this and is not like, wait a minute, that doesn't, how can you be grateful for something you earn? That doesn't really make sense. That's the, that's the finale of the video, is that people, if they work for something, then they're, then they're grateful for what they receive. Why would you be? It's yours. You earned it. You're entitled. But yeah. Anyway, sound off in the comments. Let me know what you think. Um, and well, I mean, I'll, I'll do some more if the people love it. So.